Good afternoon, everyone, from a very, very windy day in San Francisco. So I hope you can't see the storm, hear the storm in the background, but thank you so much for joining in. I'm Dr. Kim Newell Green, and I'll be the moderator for today's virtual grand rounds entitled The Changing Landscape of Reproductive Health, What Clinicians Need to Know. First of all, I want to say that we're very excited to announce a new title for our series. We are now the Emerging Public Health Issues. Um, we were previously COVID Grand Rounds. Uh, the series, however, will continue and be an incredibly strong partnership between the California Medical Association and the California Department of Public Health to deliver relevant and up-to-the-minute public health education for physicians in California. Um, with the public health emergency ending on February 28th and nationally on May 11th, that was in California, we wanted to pivot the series to address all public health topics relevant to California physicians, and you've seen some programming related to that. So we'll include COVID-19 and other emerging infectious diseases, but also important topics like the one we're talking about today so that we can give you all access to the most current science-based information from the top experts in our state and nationally. We've received so much great feedback on this series and we hope to continue um, helping you all in your practices, caring for your patients as being members of your community and advocating for uh, science and public health in our state. Uh, next, oh, here are our speaker's disclosures. Um, next slide, please. And just a reminder, uh, oh, that's our agenda for today. Next slide, please. And just a reminder that um, we are accredited for CME credit. You have to complete the survey that you'll get in your inbox today at about 5 p.m. and attest to attendance, and we'll send you your certificates. So um, following Dobbs versus Jackson ruling by the Supreme Court in June of 2022, the laws involving reproductive care have been rapidly shifting across the nation. Providers in California and elsewhere are watching subsequent legislation and court rulings that may impact our ability to provide a wide spectrum of re reproductive care whether it's major drug companies changing their formularies ahead of any physician or science-based reason to do so, or friends being subjected to millions of dollars of lawsuits for text chains that incriminate them in supporting a woman's right to manage her pregnancy. The state of reproductive rights is changing rapidly with widespread implications for the care of women and people desiring reproductive services. In this webinar, we are so thrilled to have some experts here two physicians and a lawyer to tell us about the current state of reproductive rights in California. Um, we'll get some practical information about how to provide safe reproductive care and to follow it in the current and shifting environment. Our first speaker will be Dr. Shin McRae. She's the Interim Associate Vice President for Academic Health Sciences for the University of California Health. And in this role, she leads and provides strategic direction to advance the University of California Academic Health Sciences mission and the goals of the individual campuses and the system overall. Um, for all of our speakers, I'm gonna be brief because they have so much to say, but please do look up their full bios online. Um, Dr. McRae is currently holding also her position as the Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education and the designated institutional official at the University of California Irvine School of Medicine and is an Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. She provides care at UC Irvine Health in Orange and Tibor Rubin VA Medical Center in Long Beach. She um, is here today to speak from her point of view and we're so grateful to have her today, Dr. McRae. Thank you, Kim, and thank you everyone for joining us today. The University of California is happy and honored to be part of California Medical Association's expanded Grand Round series and greatly appreciate CMA for providing this platform to educate physicians and other healthcare providers on important current topics that impact our profession and our patients' health. University of California Health is comprised of six academic health centers, 20 health professional schools, which include medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, public health, optometry, and veterinary medicine, the Global Health Institute, and comprehensive services that stretch across the state that are dedicated to improving the health of our communities. System-wide, we have almost 6,000 residents and fellows and approximately 3,500 medical students. Next slide, please. Today, each of us will be sharing our own individual views, not necessarily the view of the University of California. 
The information provided is not intended to be legal or medical advice, but purely an educational session. I also want to take a moment to say that we appreciate that there are many identities and not everyone who needs an abortion may identify as a woman. We will try to represent the diversity that exists among us all and use inclusive language through the presentation. Next slide, please. So I will be focusing on the impact that the ruling of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization and the overturning of Roe v. Wade has had on medical education. And then Rachel Nazowski will be describing the ever-changing legal landscape and considerations that our providers should make when engaging in patient care activities. And then Dr. Harkin will be providing a review of data regarding health and other outcomes. We will have questions at the end and we'll try to get to as many as possible, but apologize in advance for any questions that we're not able to address. Next slide, please. So here's some background information on the number of accredited OBGYN residency programs and trainees that exist in the US. So we have 299 accredited programs with 5,861 trainees. And then according to the data of last academic year, OBGYN residents made up 3.8% of all active residents and fellows in the US. The total number of all residents and fellows last academic year was approximately 153,000. In California, we have approximately 8% of our country's OBGYN residents. University of California has six OBGYN residency programs with 170 approved positions, which is about 32% of California's residency positions. And we also have four complex family planning fellowships. And UCI also plans to apply for accreditation of a new family planning fellowship later this year, which will put us at five. Next slide, please. So the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, ACGME, revised their OBGYN program requirements in September of 2022 following the Dobbs decision. And the requirements stated that residents must be involved in educating patients on the surgical and medical therapeutic options related to the provision of abortions. They are requiring that programs provide clinical experience or access to clinical experience in the provision of abortions as part of the curriculum. If the programs in a jurisdiction where resident access to this clinical experience is unlawful, the program must provide access to the clinical experience in a different jurisdiction where it is lawful. And support has to be provided by the program in partnership with the sponsoring institution. So this support may require financial, educational, other resources. And if the program and or the sponsoring institution fails to provide the support or penalizes residents who receive such support, the program would be considered non-compliant with this requirement. Next slide, please. Um, family medicine residents also have a requirement regarding reproductive care, but it's more general. It states that they have to have clinical experiences focused on the care of women with gynecologic issues. The requirement is more general. However, this is an extremely important group of providers who are critical to ensuring adequate access to comprehensive reproductive care. Next slide. So this is a map from the Guttmacher Institute. I strongly recommend checking out their website if you have not already. It has a wealth of data as well as regularly updated policy information and research. This map shows in dark red the 12 states that have an abortion ban in place. It's labeled here as most restrictive. The training programs and health professional schools in those red states are faced with a dilemma of limiting what their students and residents are permitted to learn, which will have a profound effect, of course, on the next generation of health providers' medical knowledge and skill set and the health as well as socioeconomic outcomes of patients. Next slide, please. For this current academic year, there are 96,000 students enrolled in allopathic medical schools. 
21% of those students, about 20,000 students, are in states with abortion bans. In the last academic year, there were 299 OBGYN residency programs, as I stated before, and approximately 5,800 residents total. And about 20% of those residents, or approximately 1,100 residents, are in states with abortion bans. Next slide. This map is showing the locations of OBGYN residency programs across the nation. It illustrates the vast deserts without any OBGYN residency programs, and thus indirectly is pointing out all the areas of OBGYN provider shortages. Over half of all U.S. counties have no practicing OBGYN provider, and this is home to more than 10 million women. So there's already large areas across the country without enough OBGYN physicians, but now there are going to be states with OBGYN physicians who've gone without any training in abortion care. So millions of women who must travel very far to obtain comprehensive evidence-based health care. And the issue of poor access to OBGYN care is compounded by an aging workforce without a concurrent proportionate growth in younger OBGYN doctors. In 2017, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists estimated that in 2020, there'd be a shortage of 8,800 practicing OBGYNs nationwide. And as we continue on this trajectory, the shortage will go up to 22,000 by 2050. Even in California, there are eight counties without any OBGYN physicians and 11 counties with less than five OBGYN physicians. And in 2018, there was a study done and they listed the top 10 metropolitan statistical areas most likely to suffer a shortage of OBGYNs in the US. And number two on that list was Los Angeles and number five was Riverside. So the questions remain, what's going to happen to our medical students? Are they going to keep their interest in OBGYN and just apply to programs in the state without restrictions? Are you going to see a shift in applications? Or are medical students just going to be discouraged from going into OBGYN completely because they know they can't provide comprehensive care in so many states? And then will this magnify problems with access to care and increase healthcare disparities in states with restrictions? Next slide, please. To adequately address the healthcare needs of women, we need more physicians across specialties who are committed to providing comprehensive evidence-based reproductive health care. When you look at the breakdown of all medicine residents and fellows, OBGYN residents only make up 3.8% of them. We really need help from our primary care colleagues. So when you combine internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, and emergency medicine residents, that makes up 42% of the resident pool. And in 2022, that was equal to 64,000 residents. Next slide, please. So some considerations, if you're going to be accepting trainees from restricted states, just make sure that the already existing trainees are not going to be negatively impacted because the ACGME requires adequate faculty supervision, exposure to adequate number of cases. Specifically, OBGYN residents need to participate in a minimum of 20 abortion cases. Also things to think about, making sure that there's adequate support for the trainees if they're coming from a restricted state. If it's a state school, are they still covering the salary and benefits, the travel expenses, the housing, malpractice insurance? And then another consideration, although we're not aware of any cases, there have been some vague threats of legal implications for providers who participate in abortion care and then return to their home state with restrictions. Um, for example, a state medical board may declare their conduct was unprofessional upon return to the home state. Again, I'm not aware though of any concrete incidents of this kind. In terms of risks, we're just gonna have a growing number of OBGYN physicians who are not competent in all of the ACGME required patient care skills. Next slide, please. Other possible factors that will pose as barriers to training or access to care. State medical board licensure. If an out-of-state trainee is required to go through the full application process to get a license for a rotation, 
this may significantly delay or even prevent out-of-state trainees from coming in to get their required training. Pharmacy regulations, you have the REMS process, pharmacies need to be certified uh, by the manufacturer in order to dispense medications. Providers have to take the REMS training and be certified. Um, mail order rules, out of state mail order pharmacy typically have to be licensed in the state where they're distributing or dispensing the drug and have to comply with that state's laws. And then there is the pending ruling that um, will occur in Texas regarding the Fipristone. Um, cost of service, the cost for, um, for patients can be substantial. The cost of an abortion, the associate travel can be extraordinarily expensive. And there's also the opportunity costs such as missing work. Um, reimbursement of services, in order for facilities to be able to function and just pay the bills, need to make sure that reimbursement is adequate. So reimbursement needs to be increased. Um, telehealth for medication abortions, even when the public health emergency is over, we need to acknowledge the literature that shows the safety of medication abortions over telehealth and through mail order. We need to continue making evidence-based decisions grounded in science when figuring out our what is the best treatment plan for our patients. Next slide, please. On this last slide, I just want to highlight some of University of California leaders who've been trailblazers and inspiring advocates for access to comprehensive, high-quality health care, health and gender equity. We have Dr. Jody Steinauer, Dr. Biftu Mangesha, Dr. Daniel Grossman, Dr. Andola Prada, and Dr. Ushma Upade. Um, and I also want to highlight the website Innovating Education. It is a fantastic website which offers online modules along with assessments, which is great for attendings and trainees. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rachel Nazowski. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dina. So, uh, yeah, next slide, please. In the interest of time, I'm not going to review the details of the Supreme Court's holding in the Dobbs case, but I will walk through some history on the fight for individual self-determination and evidence-based practice. Efforts to criminalize abortion date back 200 years in the United States and escalated through an organization organized criminalization campaign in the mid-1800s. By 1910, a full decade before the 19th Amendment was ratified to guarantee women the right to vote, abortion was unlawful in every state. I'm gonna spend a few minutes here addressing why the Dobbs decision left in its wake so much uncertainty for providers and patients, not only in care limiting states, but in California as well and then briefly discuss some of the steps that the federal government and California leaders have taken in response. I'll focus the rest of my remarks on addressing telehealth options, privacy considerations, and some of the other important questions front and center for providers in California and the patients who seek care here. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Harkin to share what all of this means in practice. Um, next slide, please. The U.S. Constitution's Supremacy Clause provides that the laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. That means that federal law, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, trumps conflicting state laws. A number of states began repealing their bans or enacting reforms to permit abortion, at least in some cases. By 1973, when the U.S. Supreme Court decided Roe v. Wade, State law governing a person's right to terminate their own pregnancy varied across the country. The court essentially held that the U.S. Constitution protects a woman's right to obtain an abortion prior to fetal viability, setting a floor of protections nationwide. In response to that holding, though, a series of federal laws were enacted to bar the use of federal funds to pay for abortion, and to protect from discrimination individuals and organizations who object to abortion based on religious beliefs or moral convictions. Last year, when the Supreme Court overturned Roe and Casey, draconian state bans and restrictions that had been on the books since before 1973 
were essentially resurrected and others that had been enacted in anticipation of Roe's reversal became effective. Next slide, please. This map that Dr. McRae showed earlier reflects where we stand today. More than half the states ban or substantially restrict abortion. By the beginning of the year, 25 had laws that imposed restrictions greater than those permitted under Roe. Next slide. In the meantime, only a handful of states, including California, have enacted constitutional amendments to protect reproductive freedom. A dozen or so have enacted laws to accomplish similar objectives in a perhaps less durable manner. And in several more, the state's high courts have recognized a state constitutional right to have an abortion. California and some others have also enacted what are called shield laws designed to affirmatively protect abortion providers practicing in those states and their patients from the reach of remote states bans and restrictions. It is not yet clear precisely how the conflicts among these laws in California and states that ban abortion are going to play out. One theme I want to highlight here, though, is how states hostile to abortion had made it increasingly difficult to access abortion, sorry, even before Dobbs for other than the most privileged individuals, for example, by banning state Medicaid programs and even private insurers from covering the service. Next slide, please. The White House and uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services have taken some action in response to Dobbs, but its impact is limited because there's inadequate support in Congress to legislatively protect abortion access nationwide. Among these efforts is some loosening of FDA restrictions on medication abortion through the agency's risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, or REMS, though these won't help much in care limiting states which independently regulate pharmacy practice. They add a pharmacy certification requirement to existing provider certification and patient signature mandates, and FDA's approval from for mifepristone is itself now under legal attack. We now know that a critical hearing uh, on that issue will be held this Wednesday. Next slide, please. California's response to Dobbs has been much stronger than the federal response, but remains incomplete, in part due to constitutional provisions addressing pre federal preemption and relationships between the states. In late 2021, the California Future of Abortion Council issued dozens of policy recommendations in anticipation of the Dobbs decision. These recommendations were intended to protect and expand abortion and birth control access, shield providers, patients, and other supporters against criminal, civil, and administrative exposure for seeking, providing, and facilitating abortion services, keep medical records private, and respond to disinformation campaigns. During the November general election, California voters also approved a state constitutional amendment to expressly and durably enshrine abortion rights into law. Next slide. Telehealth is often cited as an option to expand access within and outside of protective states like California. While that is certainly something to consider when both the physician and the patient are located in California, interstate practice is far more fraught. Inter interstate practice is far more fraught. Um, not only because of care limiting states bans and restrictions on their face, but also because state licensing boards, as you know, regulate the health professions and generally bar interstate practice by individuals not fully licensed in their respective states. A proposed uniform law was drafted to facilitate interstate practice and would apply a single standard to all providers treating patients in a particular state, whether in person or remotely, but the state where the care is provided would have to adopt that law and the proposed law requires provider registration and specifies that the law of the state where the patient is located applies to the services performed there. Next slide, please. Another issue that has posed a particular challenge is privacy. 
Federal and state laws that aim to protect patient privacy only go a certain distance. Even California's efforts arguably have missed the mark because they presume that records are maintained statically in the possession of treating providers and payers and even apps that in turn exercise exclusive control. But our healthcare system in the United States is interconnected and interdependent. Federal and state data sharing mandates, while well-intentioned, do not effectively address under unintended consequences. For example, the fact that a single hostile provider or administrator with legitimate access to a pregnant person's data might disclose deeply sensitive information to law enforcement authorities or other government agencies with the intent to harm that person or that companies like pharmacies that legitimately need the information to serve patients often have offices and maintain their data or at least access to those data in care limiting states. And those companies are subject to regulation and legal process in those states. Even if federal privacy law was adequately strengthened, cybersecurity breaches remain all too common. Next slide, please. I've summarized here some of the most frequently asked questions lawyers in California and elsewhere are now regularly fielding. It's important to understand here that no interstate activity is entirely without risk, but as a general rule, the greater the contact with a care limiting state, the more risk there typically is. Informed consent poses another challenge that we don't have capacity to effectively address in this forum. But I'll pose a few questions to you. What are best practices for informing individuals seeking abortion, not only what their clinical options, risks, and potential benefits are, but also about the not inconsequential legal risks that, that they may face, particularly if they remain in or return to a care-limiting state for treatment? I will say uh, that I've seen a number of providers who have started asking their patients to certify that they are in California when they have reason to believe they're not. Um, I think those are problematic because they put patients at additional risk for uh, claims of misrepresentation in their home states. Next slide, please. Last, I'll leave you with a few more things to consider. Abortion is not the end of the road, only the beginning. Advocates of abortion bans also aim to reposition birth control as abortion and to limit access to birth control, as well as gender affirming care, particularly for adolescents. And in many ways, Dobbs was just the beginning of a new wave of litigation, not just on the interstate practice issues I discussed earlier, but a judge in East Texas will hold a hearing tomorrow that could determine the future, or at least the near future of medication abortion access nationwide and has significant implications more broadly across the healthcare industry. And a man in Texas has sued several women who helped his ex-wife to terminate her pregnancy in July, 2022. And his lawyers have indicated they plan to sue the manufacturer of the medication once they determine who it was. Hmm. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Harkin, thank you. Um, just before you go, Dr. Harkin, I realize I didn't um, introduce you all up front, so I just want to briefly say, tell everyone that that was Rachel Nazowski, and she is the Deputy General Counsel of Health Affairs um, and does privacy, privacy and data protection for the UC Office of President, President. We're so happy to have had her here today, and then now we're getting ready to hear from Dr. Tabitha Harkin. Um, Dr. Tabitha Harkin, who's MD, MPH, she is a professor and the division director of complex family planning in the Department of OBGYN at the University of California, Irvine, um, where she was she was recruited to UCI to expand reproductive health services. Again, um, on all these people, go look up their bigger and really important bios online. But just briefly, Dr. Harkin founded the UCI Women's Option Center, where they provide much needed contraception and abortion services for medically high risk patients. She's also a researcher. She wins numerous teaching awards and also outstanding clinician awards. So again, we're super honored to have you here and thanks. Thank you so much for that introduction. So 
I'm going to talk about how the restrictions on reproductive health services impact the health and socioeconomic status and racial disparities. Next slide. So I'm backing up a little bit, and we're just going to talk about how common abortion is. Um, abortion is incredibly, incredibly common, and we talk about it, you hear about it all the time in the news, it's very controversial, but most people don't think they're ever going to have an abortion. And most people are, are very interested in all of these restrictions, but often people don't realize how much these restrictions are really going to impact them. Um, and I'm going to point out just how common this is and how these restrictions continue. They are going to affect you or somebody you know and love. So backing up, just looking at pregnancies in the United States. There are about 6 million pregnancies each year in the United States, and almost every other pregnancy is unintended. That's phenomenal. You know, um, we put a rover on Mars, we can do intrafetal surgery, and yet every other pregnancy in the United States is unintended. We do a phenomenally bad job of helping people control their fertility in the United States. Next. And what this means is that back is that about one in two women will experience an unintended pregnancy by the age of 45. Next. So what happens to all of those pregnancies? Next. Of those unintended, of those intended pregnancies, next. About 80% are going to end in full term births, and then about 20% are gonna end in spontaneous miscarriage or pregnancy loss. Next. Of the unintended, a woman is almost as likely to terminate the pregnancy as she is to carry the pregnancy to term. So that means that about one in four women will have at least one abortion during her lifetime. Next. And that's phenomenal to think about because, because most of us, when, when they hear that for the first time, they can't really believe it. And we're educated, we're, we're in healthcare, you know, why, why don't we know more about this? And it's really just the stigma. Nobody ever says, you know, oh, I'm not able to make that meeting because I'm having my abortion or things like that. Our patients are incredibly isolated. You know, if they were getting their appendix out, they, they would have many people that they could call to be their driver. But when it's their abortion, they rarely talk about it. So, so we just have to stop and think about how many people this is really going to impact next. So who are all of these people that are having these abortions? Next. Since nobody talks about it, let's give you some data. The vast majority the vast majority are poor, 75% are poor or low income. 62 to 73% report um, a, a religious affiliation. The most common being, um, I'm gonna have you just go back, thank you. The most common being um, Protestant or Roman Catholic. 59% already have at least one child. 39% of patients having abortions are white. And the most common age of patients is in their 20s or 30s. And that makes sense because they're the most, in the 20s and 30s, they're the most sexually active, the most fertile, the least likely to be using contraceptive regularly or appropriately. And if they get pregnant, the least likely to think that they're able to provide for a child and so more likely to terminate. But honestly, patients of every single age have terminations. Um, my oldest patient was 52. She um, thought she was in menopause. Her doctor hadn't mentioned contraception to her for years. Um, she had two children in college and she was mortified. Our youngest patients, of course, are very young and those ones are very, very rare. The very young patients are very rare. They're mostly um, from rape and incest, honestly, but the vast majority are in their 20s and 30s. Next. But abortion really um, exemplifies structural racial disparities. So even the white people make up the most common abortion patient. Black and brown people um, make up a disproportionate share of abortion patients. And this is due to their higher unintended pregnancy rates, which really ref reflect pervasive health disparities um, rooted in a long history of racism. Next. 
Abortions overall, though, are really, really, really safe. Um, once abortion became legalized, it became incredibly safe. And this is because over 90% of abortions are done in the first trimester when the uterus is really small, when there's a really um, limited blood supply. We use sterile instruments, we give antibiotics. And my favorite question to ask medical students is what conditions improve with pregnancy? What if you're seeing, if you're a doctor or a nurse or a PA and you're seeing a patient for any medical condition, what medical conditions are you seeing your patient for that are going to get better if she gets pregnant? And the answer is almost none. Infertility and pseudosciasis, the belief that you're pregnant when you're not. Otherwise, any medical condition that you're seeing a patient for is going to get worse with pregnancy. Next. And so that goes to show that pregnancy related mortality is significantly significantly many many fold higher than abortion related mortality and especially when you think about it we're in the united states where we have one of the highest maternal mortality rates of developed countries all over which is not a thing that we're proud of next now pregnancy also is a big um, example of racial disparities. So when you think of maternal mortality and you look at it, um, knowing that you're white in the United States, overall your maternal mortality rate is still much higher than it is in developed countries elsewhere. But now if you're black, your maternal mortality rate is astronomically high. And next, the Joint Commission recognizing how high this is actually put out a report in January and it said that maternal mortality rates for black Americans are is even higher. It's now 55 per 100,000 live births. So it's getting worse. So if we restrict abortion and we restrict contraception, our default in the United States is continuing pregnancies in places where we have really, really high maternal mortality rates. Next. And now you compound that by geographic disparities in maternal mortality. And you see the states that are darker in color have much, much higher maternal mortality rates than, than the ones that are lighter colored. The gray states, we don't really have data for. And this is likely due to policy choices that contribute to health disparities. Next. So our distinguished professor of law, Michelle Goodwin at UCI, wrote that it's no coincidence that the states that ban abortion have worse maternal mortality rates than the ones that don't. So next, what you see in the dark blue column are the states where abortion is highly restricted. Next, in the white column next to it are the states where abortion is relatively unrestricted. And on every single health indicator, children in poverty, uninsured, uninsured women, uninsured children, low birth weight babies, teen births, infant mortality, and maternal mortality, the states that ban abortions and make it highly restricted do worse on all of these health indicators. And again, this is likely due to policy choices that contribute to these health disparities. Next. So, what happens when women can't get an abortion? If a lot of these restrictions go through and they start restricting um, or underfunding contraception, what's going to be the impact of all these unplanned births? Next. Dr. Diana Green Foster from UCSF did this wonderful study. I recommend everybody look it up or buy the book. You can see it in the light blue on the side called the Turnaway Study. And she recruited a thousand women from all over the United States. And she compared women who received their abortion to women who were turned away and had a baby. And she compared the groups of people who were very, very close in gestational age. So she didn't compare first trimester to second trimester patients because those are very different patients. She, can, she compared people who came in just under the gestational age limit for the clinic and just over. And she followed them every six months for five years. And what she found was that women denied an abortion. Next had a four times greater odds of living um, below the federal poverty level than women who were able to obtain their desired abortion. Next. Also, she found that they were less likely to have full-time employment for the 2.5 years following that delivery. And this just confirms that birthing and parenting have major economic implications for women. We've known this 
all along, but it's one of the first studies that really proves it. Those women who are forced to continue their pregnancy are more likely to stay with an abusive partner. However, there's no difference in the, their level of depression, anxiety, or suicidal ideation when comparing the ones who continue to terminate. The results, the impact on the children of those women who were denied a desired abortion, next. Children are more likely to live in poverty for the moms who were forced to continue their pregnancy because remember, 59% of women who obtain an abortion have already had one child, one or more ch children. Those children have lower scores on the PEDS developmental milestones. They have no difference in health, injuries, disabilities, or living with their mother though when you compare the two groups. Next. So abortion access is health equity. Next. Women with lower income are half as likely to have health insurance. Next. And this means that they have decreased access to health care, decreased contraceptive use, which obviously goes hand in hand. Next. Thus, they have more increased unplanned pregnancies, and they have those pregnancies in a setting with less social support and in the full spectrum of the social drivers of health and health disparities. Next. An average abortion costs more than 50% of a woman's monthly income. Because remember, 75% of patients who have abortions are at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. So, a first trimester abortion costs more than half her monthly income. Next. And then you add in the fact that she already has children and so she needs to get childcare for the day or two days that she's off for the procedure plus travel. And now we're talking about travel for one to two to three days, depending on how far away she lives from a place that has legal abortion. And you're talking about abortions that are just not affordable for a vast majority of women. And so we're very worried about women starting to turn to self-induced abortion. And while medication abortion is very much available, that's so safe that we're not worried about it. But now with all the legislation that's going to make that illegal, there's a lot of concern that we're gonna go back to the days when women were self-inflicting trauma with coat hangers or, or devices or, or foreign bodies because they're so desperate to terminate a pregnancy. Next. So women do not need to find themselves in violent or threatening circumstances in order to exercise their right to terminate a pregnancy. Next. Women need reproductive rights because we do not live in a world with gender equality and birthing and raising children continues to be a huge contributing factor to this inequity. So abortion is incredibly, incredibly common. We know from very good data that making it restricted or illegal does not decrease the incidence, but we know that making it illegal only increases the morbidity and mortality related to this. And it will further worsen the already very bad health and racial disparities in medicine. Next. Thank you so much for joining us for our talk today. And I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Thanks so much, Dr. Harkin. Um, so many questions here, and we'll invite the other two back on camera. Um, here we go. Um, I just want to start. We had a lot of sort of really complex, detailed information about the laws and about the implications here. Just practically, how should California providers think about treating patients who are requesting abortion services. First of all, if those if those patients are in California, are there any considerations that they need to make that are different than pre-dogs? And then second of all, I want to talk about um, concerns about treating patients who are not in the state of California or who you worried about maybe from another state, particularly in a telehealth situation. Rachel, you, you talked about, you know, it's not a great idea to certify that folks are in California, but what risks are there for California providers who may knowingly or unknowingly treat folks outside of California? Yeah, so California did a lot to protect doctors who in California are provi providing abortion services, even to people from out of state. Um, 
what I would say to a doctor who does perform these services and would like to serve people from outside of California is it is wise to speak with your own legal counsel because there are relative risks in different levels of engagement with people from out of state. The risks are probably much smaller to treat an out of state person who is physically in California and will remain in California throughout the process. There's more and more risk as your contacts with out of state expand. Um, and as I noted, particularly risks with, with just their, their regular medical practice laws, right? So if, if I provide a telehealth service um, to a patient of any kind, even one that's completely legal otherwise in another state, I am typically practicing medicine in that state and every state's laws are different. And, and part of the balance is what risk are you able and willing to take as a provider? The other thing you need to consider is insurance coverage. What does your insurance provider cover? both in terms of malpractice and in terms of licensing board support and in terms of other kinds of litigation uh, that may not be professional liability litigation, um, such as the lawsuit we have from the husband um, right now. So, so understanding where those risks come from is important and, and deciding for you personally, where you're willing to be on that spectrum is important and having good legal advice is important. There are a lot of law firms that are providing free legal advice in this space. Um, and uh, I want to emphasize that. So for someone who's concerned about the cost, there, there are resources out there willing to help you. Um, and on the, the, the question you asked about the patients, I, I mean, it's easy for me to say as a lawyer, I'm not a doctor, right? But as as a lawyer and thinking about things from an LC perspective, I would say I find it problematic to ask a patient to certify that they are in California when you're providing telemedicine services. I understand the reasoning and your lawyers are right. They're trying to protect you from liability. But if the person is out of state, what you're asking them to do is falsify a form across state lines. It, it could open them up to a lot of liability and, and may not be perfect protection for you in any event. So I would think twice about that. In terms of any changes that we have right now in California, fortunately we have none. Um, and because we are trying to be a sanctuary state. And so right now we are just providing as we normally would before, which is wonderful. That's great. That's um, really nice to hear. Um, I'm gonna move to a specific medication question because a lot of people are wondering if mifepristone is banned, then what next? Um, so first of all, uh, Tabitha, maybe you can talk about um, a MISA-only protocol. How do we use medication for abortion if we can't, don't have access to mifepristone? And then um, maybe anyone can comment on, is there sort of a sense that there is a risk for misoprostol or methotrexate, the other abortive fashion, factions, fashions? So, um, there are protocols for doing um, induced abortions with mesoprostol only. Um, they are available on the WHO website. They're also available on FIGO and I believe Society of Family Planning websites. Um, we don't love them because they're not as effective and the side effects are much higher as anybody who's ever given a patient mesoprostol, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, cramping. Um, and then now we're going to triple the dose to try to improve the efficacy of it. But when you compare that to anything else, um, it's still safer than her getting desperate and finding something online or doing something to herself to, to get it done. So, so it's reasonable. We're all working already on, on looking at our own protocols for, for um, implementing that should we have limited access to mifepristone. Okay, that's helpful. Um, 
let's see, what about, you know, we've heard concerns about interstate travel by physicians who do provide abortion services and implications of them going to states where there may be, they may be at risk of being prosecuted, they may be at risk of being detained. And it's hard to imagine that happening on an individual vacation, but if you're traveling and speaking as a part of your professional life, um, do we have any sense of whether that's a real risk now and, and how we should think about that? Um, I don't put anything beyond the realm of the possible. And, and so it may be a small risk, but still a real risk. Um, the state would have to know that you perform the abortion or at least suspect it, have, have probable cause to suspect it. Um, but, um, but the other thing that traveling does is make you subject to the jurisdiction of that state um, in a very clear way. So if you're facing civil liability in that state, while California courts may protect you, that other states' courts probably don't. And so um, there may be stronger civil liability reasons why you would want to um, worry about, about traveling there. Um, and and Dr. Harkin made a, a, a really good point earlier when we were talking about the fact that you're also supporting those states when you travel there for any reason. Yeah, it's a tricky one. You're supporting the, I mean, you're supporting the state's economy, economy in some ways, and those states probably have a lot of people who disagree with the laws and, and yeah. showing up supporting um, reproductive rights in those states is maybe important too. So it's just, it's such a nuanced issue. One legal uh, thing I wanted to add on the MISO only protocol, doc, MISO Prostol is unlikely to be pulled from the market because it's not actually indicated for abortion. It's used for that off-label. So doctors do have a right to prescribe off-label. They do so with again, different levels of risk related to professional liability, but they can prescribe off-label. I would be surprised if it came off the market, although not shocked, just given where we are. Yeah. One thing that lots of participants today are asking is, what can we do to support efforts in other states to give uh, pregnant people, persons, and persons with reproductive interests access to good reproductive care. Dina, can I start with you? And that the, the sort of story around how GME it, and training of OBGYN physicians is gonna happen in this, um, in this setting of restrictions in certain states just sounds so complex to me. Um, so if you have any comments on how California is thinking about supporting that and then what we can do an advocacy effort um, in our own specialty societies or organized medicine or communities or whatever. Sure, thank you so much for asking that question. So we definitely want to be supportive and provide all the resources to expand training. And if we can optimize the virtual platform and offer online modules, to trainees across the country, and then they can do a lot of that curriculum in their home state, and then they can come to California and then actually do the hands-on clinical experiences. And that way we can get as many trainees in our programs as possible and at all of our training sites. It is important to make sure that we are addressing the licensure issues and just knocking down any possible barrier and making it as easy as possible for these trainees to come in for these short rotations. So keeping that in mind. Um, and then again, just making sure that we are integrating them well with the other trainees and no one's being negatively impacted and we have enough training sites to um, support all of our needs. Mm -hmm. and, and are these, is this concretely happening right now, either planning for this or is this training in action or this is something that's sort of uh, we're hoping for? Well, we do have out-of-state trainees coming to California sites, absolutely. Great. Amazing. I, I would love to say what can everybody do? You know, 
by the time, if you're not an OBGYN, by the time patients get to us, they're already pregnant. Um, and so the biggest thing that most people can do, not for out-of-state patients, but for your patients here, or help them control their fertility. You know, it should be a vital sign. It's like, are you hoping to get pregnant? Not hoping to get pregnant. Would you like prenatals or would you like condoms with that? You know, just always, always, always bring it up, bring it up. You you can hate contraception. You can't, if you don't remember anything about it, not a problem. Can I give you a referral to a GYN to talk about this? Just help patients avoid this because nobody wants to have an abortion. Nobody's like, when I grow up, I'm going to have an abortion, you know, and but so if you can help your patient and then also if you can call your representatives because and just let them know that you are in medicine and that you strongly support access to this because I guarantee they're getting a lot of calls to the contrary, a lot. So yeah. Rachel, any, any comments on, on sort of advocacy from your end? You don't have to. Vote and <laughs> encourage your friends in other states to vote. I, I, the, the lack of engagement in the process is, it has an impact. Mm -hmm. A huge one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super important. And, and I would say, you know, also joining your, your specialty societies, organized medicine organizations like mm -hmm. the CMA doing incredible amounts of advocacy on this front, CMA, AMA, your local medical societies. Um, that is where we have power as physicians. And so, um, so that's also an incredible vehicle for this work. Um, one of the questions uh, that you've talked about, Tabitha, is, is the fact that pregnant persons are with lower income or half as likely to have health insurance. And, um, mm -hmm. and so clearly this um, impacts, you know, BIPOC, lower income student, I mean, patients much more. Is there any signaling that in states where they have state or regional health plans that the insur that insurance for um, for reproductive things is is going to add to the kind of legislative um, uh, the legislative restrictions that are happening? Are insurance plans going to stop covering things in the reproductive rights realm? Yes, which is just going to make it much, it's just going to compound the problem so much. So, yeah. And it's going to hit the poor and BIPOC people the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, there are so many questions here. And I think that as this evolves, we'd love to have your team share information with us and maybe come back if they're major changes, but we really appreciate you keeping us all up to date. Um, I am going to just say that the next webinar in our series is Tuesday, April 25th, and um, there's going to be more information on our website, which is still covidroundca.org. Um, and um, I really want to thank you all, Dean, Rachel, and Tabitha, for, for presenting today's content and taking time to uh, educate us. And thanks to everyone listening in. Um, and just remember, you'll receive your survey about 5 p.m. today. If you want CME, you can attest to attendance. Um, and uh, the recording of the webinar is available at covidroundca.org, and the email will have instructions for that too. So look forward to seeing you all in April, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much.